I've always wanted to save the world. <laughs> it sounds silly, but uh, yes. But I did not think that architecture could be one of the ways that I could do it. I got into the field uh, with the idea of being a kind of a uh, Indiana Jones <laughs> and just kind of you know going into all these really exciting sites. So that was a very naive, immature approach to what heritage might actually be. And we felt that heritage and sustainability are two sides of the same coin. So we decided to join hands and create a larger impact. Not many architects think that climate change is something that they need to think about, but we're trying to change that. Mud as a material has always been used in construction and it's a very clean material. This material is truly magical. In India, it's all about customs and traditions. He walked around the machine with lime and camphor burning in his hand. It's like removing all the bad energies or vibes that the machine could have been born with. So that's how Hinduism is, right? You're believed to have born with certain sin and then you kind of work your way towards a sinless life. You can make mud bricks with basically any kind of uh, mud or soil. So we've got some really beautiful red soil here. This soil is further seeped. All the big particles are kind of taken away. And it's mixed with uh, what used to be sand, but is now quarry dust. So quarry dust is essentially uh, from stone quarries, the waste that you get is collected. And to this mix, you add very little bit of water just to activate the clay which is then put into the machine and the strength of the brick is basically got from the action of compression so what essentially you're doing is you're removing all the air particles from the mix and therefore getting a very very solid block so the manufacturing and the processing is done by local communities so that again you're giving back to the livelihoods to towards local communities rather than uh, large manufacturing plants and large companies so that's that's why this this material although it looks like a very normal block has a much larger reach and a much more positive impact than any other bricks or blocks that I use. <laughs> For whatever reason now you find masons who are mostly male, so the kind of camaraderie you would want to have is a little bit harder to achieve with them, so it's a bit of a social stigma to get too pally with women. So initially they'd be like, no madam, you, you can't touch the tools, you can't get muddy. But then eventually they're like, there's no point talking to her, she's going to touch the tools, she is going to get muddy. So that's one way that we found it's, it's nice to kind of break that barrier almost immediately. Then we kind of say, who defines roles, right? It's just what you feel like doing, what gives you joy. And working with my hands give me joy, so I'm doing that. And that helps you create a better relationship with the mason. In cow dung, it's basically digested fibers, right? So we add this in mud to increase the, the cohesion of the, the, of the mud particles. So we work a lot with cow dung. And it, it's quite interesting, the cow dung that we get in the cities stink really badly. But the stuff that we work with in the villages are quite pleasant to work with, actually. It's clearly what they're eating. They're eating a lot of crap in the cities and they're eating this lovely grass here. So possibly, yeah, possibly that. Rosie and I go back a very, very long, long time. We, we were roommates in college and did our architecture school together. I think, I think when you find someone, you know that you click and that's what happened with us. There was, you know, friendship was almost like immediate and then it, it's lasted us uh, 16 years. We were uh, very clear that we did not want uh, it to be a Sri Devi and Rosie Associates because the firm needs to be bigger than that. Anne Joseph, architect. Vasha and John, architect. Tejaswini, architect. Lesha Mahadesha, architect. Sanjani Ji, architect. 
Shiva architect. And then we thought about uh, about the masons on site who really make our dreams, our you know drawings and all of that a reality. So it it was kind of a no-brainer to give them the importance in the name itself. And so masons and the ink would be basically our drawings and all of that. We wanted it to be a collaborative, hands-on process on site. So you know when we stop seeing ourselves as architects who who work on just the 2D and 3D and once it moves off to site, like we we barely know what's what's going on or we just come in once in a while, but more like working as a team. So the thread is like just holding it, holding it in place, but the notch is doing the bulk of the work. I used to be in Girl Scouts, so I know a thing or two about knots. So we managed to get our poles up. This is pomegranate. I started out in the corporate world like a lot of people. And I think after a while I got disillusioned with that kind of a life. I was thinking about moving to the countryside, uh, setting up something like this. So it was on my mind and we were thinking about it until, you know, a year and a half ago, I lost my husband the love of my life. <laughs> he was my college sweetheart. I know adult life only with him. I don't know any other life. So when he died, I knew I had to rebuild life and I couldn't do it in that city anymore. This place came up. It was almost an impulse buy and I bought this place. And then I had been talking to the Mason Singh guys. I think it was important for me. They also knew them. They also knew my husband. They understood my journey. They understood where I was coming from. And somehow that translated into the design. I'm very proud of it because uh, the only cost we incurred in all of this was the metal uh, mesh. Uh, the rest was quarry waste and these are broken bricks, these are broken tiles. So it was all waste. Fiber or in this. Yeah. Okay, and just to be clear, I'm not going around shaving my dog. <laughs> I have groomer friends and they give me in bags. He comes when we are mixing mud and things like that. He wants to be part of it. Yeah. It sounds so cheesy, but it's a journey of love and pain. And I'd say that this is my dedication to my husband and the life love that I had with him. That's what it is. <laughs> you see everywhere this concrete building and there, there you're losing this uniqueness. Like, you see the same building in New York and you come here and say, you can see the same building here. The mud that is there on site, yeah. that has, seems to have like a secret gold shimmer to it. It was shining. It was a very sunny day. And then we found a yellow stone also. We thought it's a gold ore and we got very excited and sent pictures to my ma'am was also freaking out. And then, and then, um, and then that yellow stone was just a stone. So this whole site right now what we're doing is we have different experiments going on such that it'll all add to the main structure. So it's a technique of uh, mud that we use. Uh, we put mud into these bags and then we tamp them down. It becomes like a large format brick. It's like masonry. So you have two bricks and then you place this on top and then you do layers like this. The durability of, of mud against water and um, make it better and compress the strength by adding lime to it in and in return not affect its breathable properties or the properties that make it so awesome in terms of uh, air regulation, temperature regulation. So that's why lime is a good alternative for cement. When you have a very thin crack in a cement wall and water enters it, it starts building somewhere and it shows up years later as dampness. Whereas the same thing on a mud wall when water hits it, after some time it dries out because it allows the passage of air, it still continues to, to breathe even when it's on a wall. Another really great thing about lime is that it absorbs CO2, so it behaves like a plant. Mud and lime are like the co-stars, lime being more of the diva, <laughs> I'd say. <laughs> it's insect repellent, so lime wash is also used to kind of paint uh, the woodwork that we use to repel termites and things like that. You need to give it its time and you need to understand it. People don't understand it and then it starts behaving differently and then there's like, oh, mud buildings don't last or mud buildings can't withstand the rain. But actually it's your, the lack of understanding or the poor understanding of it that makes it behave in certain ways that is, is not really the fault of the material but of the way you're using it. For us, it's obvious that, you know, um, 
climate change directly uh, affects the shelter that you're going to live in. It's, it's a lot about the buildings, the flooding, the earthquakes. Uh, it's, it's a lot about the buildings and you need to start building resilient structures. culprits are uh, cement and steel. So these two industries are very, very carbon heavy. Uh, they are manufactured using raw materials at high, um, high temperatures and, and there are plants, you know, situated all across the country. And so the, the, the embodied energy in making the material itself is quite high. And then to transport it from, from the factory to the dealer, to then to the site. A lot of thought these days are going into organic food. There is a shift to, say, organic clothes as well. But organic homes and the, the health impacts that it has uh, is something that hasn't been studied sufficiently. So when we look at traditional systems, uh, one of the key uh, elements that were very often used was um, natural materials like mud, stone, bamboo, etc. Usually when you work with construction materials, you, you start feeling sick because you need a mask, you need, you need things to protect yourself because um, it's harmful for you. Whereas mud is the exact opposite, it, it's good for you. People buy clay and put it on their faces and things like that, so working with it is healing in itself. I'm trying to bring on more women masons onto the construction sites. The workers from the village, they turned up here the first day they were just, you know, they were just women from the village and I was just a woman from the city and there was that disconnect. But as we got to know each other and I started appreciating them for the knowledge they brought in and they started appreciating me for, I don't know, I think my, my intention, I don't know, or I, we bonded. I genuinely care for them and I think they care for me. <laughs> it took me such a long time just to get them to understand that we don't want men on the side because it's the concept that we're trying out, you know, it's all women. We want to try this out to see if it works. They kept saying, oh, once we start the main construction, then we'll get the men here. So I told them, uh, okay, uh, we will start the work and if there's any task that you cannot do, you come and tell me, I cannot do this, a man can do this and I can't, and we'll get a man on site. And uh, they took that as a, as a challenge. <laughs> I think the minute you start talking about issues related to gender, it automatically becomes like a you versus me kind of thing, which it really isn't. We're just saying that um, there are issues that we are feeling in, in, in the profession and we need support to change that. Let's employ more women um, in our architecture firms. Let's, let's have more women on construction sites. Let's look at their security aspects. Let, let's look at the issues that stop them from being around. I think we're clearly past that age where yeah. someone says you know, no to you in a certain way, but of course, cultural, there are cu cultural angles that come in or social angles that come in that there is a, a silent no that stops yeah. you. But the idea is to question that and to get more people to, to fight that with us. My family on the outside are like very forward thinking people, very modern uh, Indians. I have a brother, so they believe in bringing both, both kids up with equal opportunities. But I, I wouldn't blame them, they are from a different generation. So they, they still have the very traditional ideas of the role of a woman. Having said that, um, my parents are like my biggest support. Uh, they've funded my entire education. They continue to support uh, everything that that uh, you know uh, I do, that Mason Singh does. They finally accepted that, I think, but they're still really worried that I'm a single woman at 35. Uh, 
uh, unmarried and way past her expiry date. For architects, a lot is about uh, who you're servicing and who your clients are. And we were really lucky to find someone like Thomas who was, uh, you know, had the same kind of frame of mind. It's always really lovely to come back here as you can feel the vibe and the energy is very different. And it's almost as a philosophy, right, when you use uh, materials that are kind, uh, even the whole, the space kind of reflects that. From a construction perspective, uh, I, I would say that we have almost 100% stuck to sustainable practices. Two factors, one is lowest possible cost and lowest possible impact on our environment. If you look at the wood that we have used, all of them are recycled. I don't think a single tree was cut in the construction of this house. We started our firm in 2013, so we were quite young into the profession and uh, I think it was a leap of faith from your end to go with two young girls who knew just about enough to build a house, I think. Now we are a fully certified organic farm. Lovely, okay. Uh, growing uh, aromatic and medicinal plants. Mm -hmm. It's interesting to know that both the Global North and South have similar things that we can work on, which is not common understanding. People think that we're very different. But every year we have very clear goals on how to be more in inclusive and how, how to bring the idea of cultural heritage and the importance of it in, in climate action um, to the forefront. What is really uh, exciting is that, is that people uh, more and more are seeing the importance of integration of culture um, in, in, and not just looking at culture as an, uh, you know, an, an aesthetic overlay, rather kind of integrating that into policy and seeing that culture can definitely be used um, as a tool uh, to mitigate uh, climate change and, and an effective tool to Im mitigate climate change. It's tempting to say I'm going to get rid of my pain by going on a shopping spree uh, and I did it. It didn't help. We can shut ourselves off and harden ourselves, but there's a beauty to keeping it all open and the earth inspires that. And I, I would definitely tell people to try it, try it. It may sound challenging, try it at some small level. You will see that it's healing and take the plunge. <laughs> As women, people are not really expecting you to move mountains. So when you do move a mountain, uh, <laughs> they, it does, you know, it, it does create a buzz. So the, the fact that there's no expectation is great. Uh, and you, you can do what you want. To all the, all the women who are watching, um, no matter where you are and um, no matter what your profession is, no matter if you're at home, I think um, in, 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 in the whole view of um, climate action and, and being more responsible, I think the idea is to just each of us to do our own little part, to keep going and I'd love to see more women um, here next time and um, more women architects and more women everywhere. <laughs> the, the future is female. <laughs> He's still posing. Yeah. <laughs>